this afternoon's session is called Histories and the Politics of Land Acquisition. And uh, I am the chair, Sanjay Reddy. And our first speaker is Nirmala Sharma, who is a doctoral candidate in East Asian Studies at the University of Delhi. Yes. Uh, so let me turn it over to her. She'll be speaking for up to 15 minutes okay. on compulsions and contestations of ideology, the Indian National Army's justification for collaboration with the Japanese in occupied China, 1942 to 45. Nirmala. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking New School for giving me this opportunity to come here and present this paper. This is a work in progress, so I have uh, presented it at a few places, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the motivation was to get feedback and how can I uh, you know, rework my paper in a uh, better way. So I look forward to your uh, comments and uh, criticism. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the paper is called Compulsions and Contestations of Ideology. The INA's Justification for Collaboration with the Japanese in Occupied China. Before I start, uh, I would like to tell uh, for people who are not, who not, uh, not aware of what the Indian National Army was. Press uh, F5. Uh -uh. Sorry about that. So the Indian National Army was uh, uh, was an army which uh, was uh, which came into force in Southeast Asia, and uh, with the uh, uh, it was organized by Indian nationalist leaders, and uh, who who were in Japan and in in in, uh, in Southeast Asia, and primarily formed with Japanese help and consisted of uh, Indian prisoners of war. But it also had uh, quite a lot of support from the Indian civilian population in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, two persons played, I would just name two persons here, but there were uh, other people as well. Uh, Ras Bihari Bose, an Indian nationalist leader who had uh, escaped to uh, Japan and lived there, uh, played a very important role in the establishment of the Indian National Army. Uh, and then the other person was Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, a very important uh, national, uh, nationalist leader of India, uh, controversial at times, but these were the two personalities who, who kind of uh, formed, uh, played an important role. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about, uh, primarily uh, about the Indian uh, National Army in China. Before I talk about it, I would like to mention that the Indian National Army uh, has been studied by a lot of people. A lot of works have come out. But the China aspects of uh, the Indian National Army's presence has uh, not been highlighted that much. Uh, no, in fact, not many people are aware that the Indian National Army was there in China. So, uh, and if if I actually finish this work, this would put probably be the first work that has uh, you know kind of focused on it. Now, the uh, Indian National Army in China was uh, primarily uh, in terms of supporters and followers with the Indian population in China. Most of the Indian population in China uh, were uh, uh, in centers like Shanghai, Hong Kong, Nanjing, Hankou, uh, Tianjin, Macau, and Canton. And uh, these people primarily consisted of soldiers, policemen, watchmen, and political exiles. Uh, now, what do I want to look in the paper? So, so basically, my primary hypothesis is that uh, the Indian National Army actually engaged in the construction of a new alternative discourse on, on China, on the Japanese occupation of China, which I have called as the China question. It was a problem they tried to uh, address throughout the three years of their uh, like, uh, uh, that existed. And in the paper, I've looked at what were the methods that were used to, to, uh, to construct this alternative discourse, and how, what were the f features of this uh, INS discourse in China, and who was it addressed to? Now, uh, the, in the INS discourse on China, was primarily uh, you know, focused on or uh, to, 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 to oppose the already established discourse 
on the China question, which was the Indian National Congress discourse. Now, this, this discourse was a discourse of sympathy with the Chinese and, because, uh, and indignation for what the Japanese uh, perpetrated in Japan. Oh, in China, sorry. So it was a, it was a discourse just shaped largely by the um, policy of opposition to imperialism and support to the fellow sufferer of imperialism. This was also the time when Nehru, and we hear about the famed uh, friendship of Nehru and Chaka Sheik. Uh, Subhash Chandra Bose plays uh, in this paper because uh, it, it, it lasted for a very small period, three years uh, to be precise. So no, they didn't really come up with any policy directives on China. So I have basically looked at the pronouncements of Bose because he was the main leader as well as uh, writings in various propaganda magazines and other articles and try to reconstruct a story uh, like reconstruct what they thought, what, what, what was their stand on the China question, on the Japanese occupation of China. So, uh, so before I uh, tell what, what uh, INA's stand was on China, I would like to uh, go back and tell you what Bose said about China in the pre INA days. Subhash Chandra Bose was a key member of the uh, Congress party. He had also been a president. Uh, during his uh, uh, mem during his period of membership in the uh, Congress, both had at times uh, denounced uh, Japanese aggression in China and supported the Chinese masses. And uh, many a times he had uh, likened uh, Japan as the British of the East and uh, found that the Chinese were more human kind and ethical vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Japanese. And this, there's this quote uh, which he, like in a speech uh, uh, given where he said that uh, it is necessary for us to think of the means of preventing the growth of Japanese imperialism in Asia. If tomorrow China could be strong and united, I'm sure it would serve to check the spread of Japanese imperialism. This is Bose in 1936. Uh, now why was the need to have a new discourse in China? I say it was because uh, uh, the, uh, to, to legitimize collaboration with ja Japan, but also it was very important to have a, to, to provide a convincing narrative on China or the Ch Japanese occupation of China, and most importantly to counter the already established Congress discourse of sympathy. Now uh, the. Uh, the Indians in China, there was this, this history of revolutionary mobilization among the Indians in China. And, uh, but the, uh, the Indian National Congress was still uh, uh, like widely uh, supported by the Indian, Indian community in China. So one of the, one of, so, and uh, the, the stand of the Indian community prior to INA was that of sympathy with the Chinese. And when Raja Mahendra Pratap, he was also a very renowned nationalist who had lived in China, uh, Japan for a long time, visited uh, China to establish a, uh, you know, a golden corps of army, like pro-Japan army. He was castigated by the Indian community in China. So the, the, the primary idea was to, to, to allay the fears of the Indians in China vis-a-vis -vis Japan and to, to seek the support of the Indians at home as well as abroad. Uh, as I mentioned, it was primarily aimed at to, to legitimize collaboration with imperialist Japan, which, which meant that they had to reinterpret the situation in China. Uh, it also meant that they had to reverse quite a lot of earlier held perceptions of China and Japan. And this they did by a dualistic method. I, will, I have uh, dealt with it uh, in the paper. Now, what was the major uh, features of INA's discourse in China? It, uh, the, the most important feature uh, was uh, the, the need to have a pragmatic approach by Indians uh, to the war situation, like to make the most of the war situation. And Bose had, even in his days in the Congress, it, uh, reiterated that foreign policies should not be driven by morality and emotional uh, needs. So I think uh, this this was a time where he actually put to use what he had always thought of that we shouldn't be foreign policies should not be driven by uh, moral moral morality. Uh, now uh, in this new discourse on on Japanese occupation of China. Uh, the INA made liberal use of Japanese concept of pan-Asianism. Uh, 
Now, this meant that a uh, redefinition of Japan and Japan's role in Asia and particularly in China. So, a distinction was made between old Japan, which was militarist, imperialist, vis a vis a new Japan, which was a uh, harbinger of peace and stability in Asia and who was actually fighting for the uh, liberation of Asia from uh, Western imperialism. Uh, now, it also meant that they were looking at China from a very Japanese perspective. Uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek is criticized heavily in this new discourse of uh, INS discourse on, Japan, on China as being haughty and not uh, not promoting as uh, you know creating obstacle to the national unification of China, uh, which uh, Japan was uh, promoting. Now this also meant that Wang Qingwei government, Wang Qingwei's government, which was a pro-Japan, Japan-backed government, was supported by the INA vis-a-vis -vis Chiang Kai-shek's government. Uh, so Wa Wang Qingwei's gov government formed the national government, while Chiang Kai-shek is the is the is projected as the uh, corrupt government who is who is creating obstruction to national unification and national reconstruction of China. This also meant that uh, uh, there was a sp spatial uh, recon reconsideration of the problems of China. So this is a, this is not an external problem. Uh, I mean, uh, we should not. We sh our foreign policy should not be driven by what is happening inside China. This is an internal problem, and let them sort it out. Like the Chinese are fighting among themselves, like the, the, the Wang Qingwei's government and uh, KMT. So. These, I, these were the major features of this new discourse, INS discourse on China. Uh, to conclude, I would like to, uh, I'd like to point out that throughout the four, uh, three years of uh, uh, its, its existence, uh, 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 they deliberately tried to address the China question in many of its uh, speeches and in fact, when you look at the speeches of Subhash Chandra Bose throughout this period, even to a letter to Mahatma Gandhi, the China question keeps coming very frequently. There are small passages here and there, but the China question, along with uh, that India should not, uh, the, criticizing the British for its policies, the China question comes very frequently. So it was a, it was a very important problem which they tried to address. But it was also, uh, you know, driven by compulsions to ally with Japan, and of course, characterized by contestations. Uh, in its attempt to legitimize its uh, alliance with Japan, it also attempted to legitimize, to a great extent, Japanese occupation of China. And uh, as I mentioned before, it also gave a new spin to many of the earlier held perceptions. And most importantly, this new discourse involved. Uh, was characterized by silences on many aspects of the controversial aspects of Japanese occupation of China. They simply didn't talk about. And uh, it was also uh, characterized by inherent contradictions which remained. So that's why I say it was contest it was uh, it was contested. So it was it was not a very you know logically uh, uh, it was not logical but at the same time by the end of well, by 44, the entire Indian occupation, uh, Indian population in China, almost the entire, I wouldn't say entire, almost the entire Indian population in China had become part of or become members of the Indian National Army. So I would say they were, to a great extent, uh, successful in uh, in addressing the China question as far as uh, its reach to the Indian Indians in China was concerned. Uh, before I, I still have some. These are some of the pictures which I have have showed it at many places. And but for people who haven't seen it, this is this is this was uh, uh, both in Shanghai when he had visited in in Shanghai, and you can see many Indians there at the bottom, Sikh soldiers, and this was one of the magazines which was uh, published by uh, uh, by the Indian National Army headquarters in Shanghai. It was called Chalo Delhi, and uh, this is an ID card from the uh, Indian National Army uh, ID card, uh, which mentions the name of the person and the addresses. You know. uh, this is also an ID card uh, membership form, which one had to fill to become a member of the Indian National Army, and this is Indians demonstrating in Shanghai. Uh, 
This is the, the training center, Ajad Hind Forge Training Center in Shanghai. Uh, thank you. Very good. So, thank you. We have our second speaker, Wang Yinghong, between justice and development, mixed stories of land acquisition in India and China. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, before my st uh, I start my talk, I would like to thank uh, ICI for providing such a wonderful opportunity for me to hear. Uh, to my, today, my topic is about between justice and development, the major stories of language issues in India and China. Uh, when I come to this uh, issue, I think there's a big uh, issue in India and China, like I uh, list in this slide. But to a Modernity, that means some kind, of, uh, especially in the Western, we define it as the shift from the agricultural society into an industrial or post-industrial society. And uh, inside of the end, land is a very really important thing. That means uh, we, need, we need to extract uh, human resource, we need to capitals from the agriculture, and uh, then to shift to the uh, industrial. So then it's a very really important thing. Uh, one of them. So, um, so this is far more than a uh, concern of the economic development. I think it is, it is also uh, politically, it is also uh, culturally and socially. So this is my long-term project, one of my long-term projects. But here I cannot deal all of them. Uh, here what I try to apply is the lens clip of the land acquisition uh, issues in India and China. I'm not to explain anything. I'm trying to describe a little a brief picture of different aspects of land acquisition in India and China. I think this is the best uh, for my basic things for my further research. The content is that first they wish to look into what's the nature of land acquisition. It's basically land acquisition for development. What does it mean? This is why I'm working uh, first. Now is uh, define my research in this paper, the background and the main concerns. Then the main part of my talk is the mid stories of land acquisition in and between both countries. Uh, the fourth session is about conclusion and implication for further research. Uh, this is some kind of evaluations. Now it is the nature of land acquisition. Land acquisition is a compulsory acquired land from the rural displaced groups. I use the rural uh, displaced groups uh, just because uh, in Indian's case, there's more complex. There's no only person they, because the land ownership between and land ownership in India is different from China. So there is some uh, there are some people like talents and like uh, like workers in the uh, in, in the in the farms. They're different. And by China, they have only patients. There are no talents and uh, some kind of things. They, they, they may have, but not so many as in India. So this is the political group. And transfer it to the requiring bodies, uh, especially for private or public uh, companies, uh, by the state, and the land of the public purpose. So but, but then question for development is likely to incur some debate. First is the compulsory acquisition. That means uh, the state acquire the land without the consent of the persons, of the owners. So uh, this is, is likely to um, uh, uh, incur the debate. Another thing is public purpose. Its development purpose is a part of the public purpose. Sometimes it is de uh, debatable. Another thing is the different rent of the land willing to its usage. As we know, land for Real estate is higher than land for industrial usage. And industrial usage is, is higher for agriculture. So how to divide and how to dis, uh, distribute this uh, increasing increased uh, value? That will be a big problem. But why state they take acquisition, land acquisition for, uh, they, they, why they don't just leave the company to discuss, uh, to dip, uh, discuss the land price with the uh, with the landowners, just because they have some other concern. First is they want to reduce the high cost of the negotiation with the sporadic owners. They try to avoid the control of the business owner or the land mafia. And they try to avoid 
the usage for real estate to take up uh, Taylor priority. And the first, um, uh, most important thing is uh, the state want to achieve desirable development perceived by the state. So it is a development uh, state, or to be development, uh, development state, like the, in the case of India. Uh, they use language acquisition to meet the growing need for land, land for land development. Yes. So, and there's, uh, in this case, there are two possible results. One is win-win game. That means all status of the three parties are improved. And they are all satisfied with this kind of improvement. And there is zero-sum game. Some improve, some lose, or some feel lose. And then we will look into what extent the win-win game is there in both cases and what, how much the zero sum gains occurred, and what's the meanings to behind them. This way. So I, I, I think this is far more than this is some kind of uh, distribution of the value. This is, uh, this is also as well as, uh, as well a political issue, not only an uh, economy issue. So that's why I'm arguing that the justice uh, and development should be uh, secured, secured in the land acquisition. Appearance of uh, both then are extremely needed. In this talk, we will see the uh, development of state since 1980s, foothelling action as the main agent to meet the growing demand for land for development. And the main concern is the what region they take, they adopt, what kind of practice in these both countries, and what's the performance of them. And let me go to the. Uh, the main part. There's many stories. I think there's uh, rather than only one picture in the language in India and China. We can find that there are similar regulation with similar dynamics of language acquisition. There are similar component toward the language acquisition in India and China. And as well, there are different general performance on the whole. But they also have some local creative practice we can find in both cases. Similar region that means that actually since 1980s, especially like in India in 1984, there is a revision of the language acquisition law in India. They, uh, they revised the language acquisition, the aid for company into the public purpose. That means language acquisition are allowed to uh, take for uh, to pub public purpose as well as public uh, uh, for companies. So that this is a big change. Another thing is China, this uh, 1980s, uh, 1982, the land are claimed, uh, the urban land are claimed to be owned by state. At the same time, the establishment of the use right uh, of the land, and, and the, the uh, state become the moral plate of the land, the first uh, land uh, market. So only the government can acquire the land and show them to the companies, and then this is the only option in China. So this is a big change since 2000, uh, since 1980s. Another thing we need to men mention is about uh, since 2000, we try to establish uh, the rehabilitation and the settlement policy. But all of them failed at the end till now. We can find that the, actually the protest growing since 2000, even though both countries they try to prefer their region, so they fail at the end. And the, the language acquisition in India and China, the best region is very similar. So state acquire land and and transfer to the required body in India. But in China, some difference is only that the state also uh, the, uh, the state show the land to the uh, required body, requiring body. So there is the land revenue in China. And this is uh, some difference inside. Uh, similar complaints about the language acquisition, uh, particularly since 2000, uh, we can see they are different. Uh, there are similar uh, complaints. One is dispolarization to the displaced group. Um, uh, this they came to improve with men. And there is violent behavior of government. And in India, that's the main reason for the investment uh, stagnance. And too much land acquired land actually needed. And similar things have been happened in China. Low compensation without resettlement, while land have been, uh, 
uh, behavior of the government and look, uh, land financial of local government. A huge amount of land left without being used after acquired. But there is different general performance on the whole. The first thing is there are two thirds of different attitudes toward land acquisition of peasants in China, which cannot be found in case of India. Another thing is that Chinese land acquisition put forward even under failure practice since 2000, 2000, while land acquisition in India are at stagnance due to the protests. This is the different force of performance and acquisition. In China, you can find that uh, now to uh, 1998, there is a big difference. Before that, negotiation is goes smoothly. And sometimes the persons, they, are, they would like to submit their land. They, they, they treat land as some kind of burden at the time. But after that, some uh, things turn different. And the contribution development is totally different. Like that, this the land acquisition acquired uh, on the whole. We can find that since 2000, Chinese land acquisition, the, the total amount is much higher than the before. But in the next make we can find next uh, uh, in the next one we can find that <coughs> Indian uh, investment are stagnant due to land acquisition. It is about uh, six hundred project and valued uh, one hundred billion dollars are stagnant due to land acquisition. And this is the difference of the urbanization rate in India and China, as uh, Zheng Yu mentioned before. And this is the different contribution of the secondary and uh, sector and GDP in India and China. We can find that in India is far less. Uh, the main contributor is the service, uh, the third industry. But in China, we can find that the third, the third one and the second one, both of them contribute to the high uh, economy growth. So that means their contribution to uh, economic growth is very different. But we can find other, other sets of stories. There's the local creative politics. I call it local creative politics. We found in both cases. Like in, 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 this is a report in Shenzhen. It, it is said that a millionaire was, uh, a millionaire was uh, met due to the land acquisition. And even some people tell me that like in Guangzhou, people are waiting for land acquisition. And some of them shipped to Singapore after land acquisition. Uh, another thing is that like, uh, in India, we can find in Gujarat, it's reported that a uh, color party that was made due to the land acquisition. And there are different kinds of politics. Like, we can find that this kind of like Langhai, and even in Shenzhen, I find it there. We can find that the person that built their own industrial park and then this it to the small companies or big companies. And so that they don't need to acquire land, that's the only thing they need to do is to provide, allow them to do this, give them the plan uh, of the land. Another thing is that in Chengdu, Chengdu, uh, there's more companies. But on the, the whole, is that the, the government reorganized the rural land and just buy the extra, okay, extra construct land from the later, then show to the requiring body, and the requiring body build new buildings for the displaced group. So all the three parties' status are increased, are improved in this, uh, uh, in this practice. And, and good data, there is something like land bank and land pooling. Like this land pooling, we, we can find that the state acquired only 40% of the land. And they return 60% of the land to the, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, to the displaced group to the land owners. And in this 40%, they will use it for like infrastructure and like for land bank for further development. So in this case, both of the three parties' uh, status can be improved. So that's my conclusion. There's missed stories rather than one story in India and China and the acquisition. And generally speaking, we can say that in both cases, uh, we can find that there are good stories and bad stories, the heavy stories and blood stories, bloody stories. Uh, and there are also generally national pictures that we can find. There are also special local pictures we can find. In between the both cases, generally we can say that in China, there, there, have one, uh, there is uh, one excellent uh, period of land acquisition uh, before 2000. But after that, uh, it's different. Another thing is that uh, for China, 
uh, it can put forward language decision under the very various uh, protests, but this did not happen in India. So for further research, we need to do into what variable they contribute to a different performance, even under similar pressure and protests. That's why I'm, I already work in the in US uh, three months. Uh, I, I just returned from NUS. Uh, I'm working on the Singular and Wukan. And I think we need to, OK, we need to see how the local collective regulation can be possible under the same national framework. Sometimes they are illegal at the beginning. Sometimes they are legal, sometimes they are illegal. But, but this did happen. And this may, uh, sometimes they may uh, all the parties satisfied. So what's the politics behind them? This we need to see. And what will the new region, like India, there's LRR, and China, there will become a new land administration law. Uh, so what, will, what they will bring to the change? There will, there's no further research. OK, that's all. Thank you for the attention. Prakash Kashwan, Institutional Political Economy of Land Acquisition in India, with a glance over the Himalayas. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers um, for this opportunity to, to share some of this research. I want to start by saying a couple of um, sentences about um, sort of background to my work. I've been trained in uh, one variation of institutional analysis. Um, mm political economy, micro-political economy. Uh, and I'm trying to build on that by bringing in um, insights from a variety of social science disciplines. So you know, I, I call myself the Google Scholar generation of scholars. Uh, when I do a Google Scholar search, I rarely actually look at the, the name of the journal. You know, so I'm, I'm typing keywords that are based on a practical description of my problem, say land acquisition or whatever. And then if I find a paper in history journal, I'll read that. Right? So I'm not wedded to a particular uh, disciplinary um, tradition. And that sometimes is confusing, but sometimes uh, hopefully rewarding. So let me begin by sort of uh, giving you an outline. I want to lay out my motivation in the politics of land acquisition in India. Uh, and it's, it's a process that's going through transition. And I want to look at transition from a particular perspective. I'll lay out the key questions. I'll describe briefly the methods, the theoretical framework. Uh, and then I want to get into what I call as the political foundation of property rights. Um, and uh, I'll talk about how um, the idea of property rights or land rights is conceptualized among different sections of, of Indian population and at different hierarchical levels of Indian political system and what it means for scholars uh, to sort of understand and study uh, the politics of land acquisition under such conditions. So um, briefly, to describe the land acquisition process, we have this glorious tradition of colonial era uh, Land Acquisition Act of 1894, which was active until the day, day before yesterday. Uh, and the, there are strong foundations in the conceptual um, uh, parameters of eminent domain public interest versus urgency clause, and non-justiciability of the land acquisition process. So it's not some law which is you know, out there and is not used or whatever, but it is very strongly founded law, the implications of which actually permeate throughout uh, the political system in many, many ways. And I hope to talk about some of that. Now, because of this clearly unjust and uh, colonial era uh, practices, there have been lots of fights and conflicts, and very visible ones, some of them. And, and because of that, the Indian government has responded by bringing out this land acquisition uh, law, um, new law, uh, in, which was enacted by the end of 2013 and came into effect January 1st. Some of the salient features of this law is that the compensation has been increased many fold, particularly in rural areas because the rural land markets are undervalued. Uh, the compensation for non-landholders who are dependent on the land. That's a really radical sort of provision, which is in the formal law now. Um, governments and companies would require prior and informed consent of 70% of the affected people, including those people who are not landowners. right? Uh, and they require a very uh, exhaustive social impact assessment. Uh, all of these are very, very radical provisions in many, many ways. Um, and so based on this and based on all the protests and movements that you've seen, 
Um, many analysts, including uh, Sanjay Chakravarti, who has come out with this recent book, he's basically arguing that the history of primitive and crony capitalism and state corruption and greed and insensitivity has ended. Right? So the argument is that there's a new shift in the land acquisition politics in India. And, um, but on the other hand, there are many people, including myself, who would argue that uh, this picture looks very different when you look at the, the whole issue from the perspective of land rights movements. Um, this would have been another paper, but let me uh, just say that right around the time when the new law was being debated, a huge land rights movement had to sort of resort to some kind of face-saving exercise with the government. Government carried the day in a movement that was threatening to walk 10,000 people over 2,075 miles, right? In the end, long story short, in the end, government prevailed, right? And, and, and right now, it seems that Congress is not even worried uh, as so much as to put anything of that in their manifesto uh, in, the, in the current ongoing elections. So there are two different views of what's going on in the Lin Indian land acquisition mm -hmm. politics. And my argument is that these two different views are partly related to the theoretical frameworks that different scholars use to analyze land acquisition politics. I'll briefly try to lay out the, the sort of dominant framework and then lay out an alternative framework uh, and use that also to do an empirical sort of argument about the, uh, the politics of land acquisition, and then to use that to say something about comparative analysis, ambitious agenda. So the key questions, my um, point of departure is that uh, land acquisition is about redefining land relations or property rights relations, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, changing some statutory uh, law or, or framework. Um, and then, as I said, I look at it from two different uh, types of institutional frameworks and, and want to raise this question as to what it um, sort of, uh, you know, what difference does it make whether you use one type of theoretical framework opposed to another type of uh, theoretical framework? And finally, what are the implications for uh, India-China comparative analysis? I'll come back to these pictures a little later in the, in the presentation. Uh, partly as a response to uh, comments that I received from colleagues, I turned my presentation upside down so this is for the reviewers if you are wondering you know, what's going on in the presentation. Um, my research approach, I briefly want to sort of talk about, you know, generally we talk about either an inductive or a deductive approach. Um, and my argument is that none of these approaches by themselves work really well when we are talking about you know, phenomenon that uh, goes across historical sort of temporal uh, dimension cross-scale, national versus local, and leave alone cross-national arguments. And then interdisciplinary, you bring in political, economic, and social consideration into your argument. Then you know uh, what works is what is called as abductive or recursive sort of uh, approach, which is more or less similar to, you know, if you think about how doctors actually diagnose diseases and symptoms and you know, go back and forth between theory and empirical observation. That's the kind of approach that I'm trying to sort of develop vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, particular question. Um, in addition to my own field research, uh, you know, a full year of research in, in Gujarat in 2009, um, and uh, you know, I look at studies that are you know, field research-based ethnographic studies you know, in whichever uh, discipline, but I draw on them as if you know, I'm going there and, and conducting a proxy sort of field work which is different from you know, the standard secondary uh, reference to the literature. Finally, also, I also bring to this uh, my 15-year-long engagement with the question of forest and land rights uh, through you know, practice and activism and, and with, with uh, a variety of engagements with social movements, NGOs, and so forth. Some of those pictures here. This is my claim to fame as, far as um, photography is concerned. This was published on the cover of a magazine. Uh, so the key debates in property rights literature have to do with uh, one, you know, there's the standard economic theory of property rights. Scarcity uh, leads to increased valuation, which leads to people, you know, asserting exclusive property rights. Um, but there's a background scaffolding of, of the rule of law. Um, next step is the sort of new institutional economics, which talks about the information and the behavioral conditions, conditions that lead to particular kind of actions vis-a-vis -vis any outcome. But here in this particular context, uh, property rights are understood as a hierarchy of rule-bound rights, 
right, uh, which can be exercised within the context of a particular kind of uh, legal or institutional framework. And finally, we have the, the social uh, anthropology and, 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 and sort of uh, the, the other theories which talk about relational uh, dimensions of property rights uh, in terms of you know, property rights being embedded in social and cultural relations. I engaged with that argument, but will not do that in, in this paper. But if you, you know, press me, I'll be happy to sort of you know, uh, talk how I think about those arguments vis a vis the approach that I'm laying out here. But none of these approaches actually engage with the the politics of power um, or you know, the politics of strategic uh, maneuvering on the part of all kinds of actors, right? not just a state actors, but actors in society, civil society, and so forth. Um, so I, I basically what I'm doing is thickening the plot vis-a-vis -vis institutional economics uh, to use that to, to sort of. Now, I want you to sort of take a moment to look at this picture. These are leaders, local leaders, village leaders, traditional leaders in Gujarat. And, um, so you know, if you take a moment to look at their facial expressions and their mustaches and how they go together in an expression of articulation of power. Um, but they are sitting on a swing. I don't know if some of you use that. And it's a very tricky thing to sit on. You know? But you imagine moving this swing like almost uh, 80 degrees, and these leaders will stay exactly like that, with their facial expressions, with their body being stiff and everything. Right? Um, now, None, my argument is that none of the predominant theories of property rights balance nearly as well as these leaders do. And, and uh, you know, the, this is the references to the swimming, swinging politics of rural uh, land processes and land relations. How do we actually make these theories sit on this swing without actually, uh, you know, hobbling up the, the this thing? So the, the political economy of institution uh, perspective that I bring to this debate uh, is basically based on this idea that property rights, as well as many other kinds of institutions, are an outcome of historical struggles around state making, state building, uh, control, territorial control, and all of that sort of literature. And I particularly read uh, David Ludden's work and, and Dharma Kumar, who's an Indian economist, uh, if you read some of them. Um, and people often justify their land rights in terms of references to state uh, legitimation that has been received by some authority from state, either because of allocation of land rights or because of some historical connection with the authority. Right? So state is not that you know, out there, up there structure which is sort of magically you know, uh, moving people like puppets, but it is you know, seen as being experienced and understood by citizens. This is the everyday state literature, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, uh, and, and I find this phrase of disaggregated unity. The state presents a disaggregated unity at the local level, uh, and, and people engage with the state, uh, with the entrenched authority of the state at the local level. The same model in a different way. I have a more complicated one, but I left it out of the presentation. So um, in the paper, I describe how the, uh, the Indian sort of cultural, whatever, idea of property rights is uh, is founded very closely to link to the Lockean framework of you know, um, uh, the labor value of, of property and the land and so forth. Um, um, and the collection of tribute by the state authorities or state authorized agents has been routinized and legitimized for a long, long time. You know, it is very strongly embedded in the thinking so that when I exercise my land rights, I'm paying uh, a land tax for excising land rights, not in expectation of some future public goods delivery, which is the standard sort of uh, discussion in the literature. And uh, to, to make this happen, Indian state, beginning the medieval uh, era, has put up a very strong uh, middle structure of you know, leaders and intermediaries. One of those is called police Patel. Now, if you think about this term, it brings the idea of traditional leader of Patel with the modern idea of police. And these, these guys continue to be active even today in, in the politics of land rights and land acquisition. Um, I'm running out of time, and I'm sort of wondering. Um, so you know, one of the dimensions of eminent domain, which is often not uh, talked about in the standard uh, discussions of land acquisition, is that almost 45% of the land is completely owned and controlled by the state. right? But there are huge populations of people who are dependent on these state-owned lands. 
So the exercise of eminent domain in these 45% of the Indian land is sort of you know, institutionalized. It's, it's taken for granted. You know, they don't even have to formally notify any, anybody so far you know, prior to this law. Um, and then you know, we have all of these common uh, village lands and so forth, which are often thought of as common property, but they are actually state-owned uh, state lands in, in practice. Um, and so all of this actually leaves out 75% of the cases of land acquisition have very little to do with private land, property rights, compensation, and all of that, particularly historically. And increasingly, I think we'll see more and more of uh, the real private land being, being acquired. So if you look at uh, the perspective of people who are affected by the politics of land rights, much of the current discussion actually does not speak to the politics of land acquisition of the commons and other kinds of lands. Uh, in which the state actually exercises an absolute territorial power. Now, don't be mistaken, this is not, again, an idea of, of an omnipotent state, but the state kind of feeds into an ongoing and long-standing uh, agrarian crisis, which is leading to a very serious kind of agrarian differentiation at the local level, which means that within local communities who have people who are willing to reach out to the state and invite the state to acquire land, for example, so that they can be the middle broker, middle, um, you know, middlemen and, and brokers and so forth, right? So you have an edifice of law and a legal jurisprudence supported by uh, people at the local level, agents at the local level who are willing to act as the willing accomplices of the state, right? Um, and then when you have all of this going on for a long, long time. Think about a poor man who's you know, trying to secure their interest in the context of this structure of both the dominant legal uh, structure but also the local differentiation, which means that state and state agents will always find some partners at the local level. So as a poor man, I want to respond to this reality that I'm faced with, right? Not with some notion of citizen demanding their rights or somebody asserting their land rights. So when you think about uh, the responses of local people in that context, then the entire idea of analyzing federal structure, electoral politics, and local government from a formal institutional perspective seems almost you know, irrelevant in many, many ways. Right? I'm, I'm saying that for the sake of sort of ex exaggeration, but I'm saying there's a lot more going on than just looking at the formal institutional processes. Right? OK, I'll skip through this. Uh, but here, you know, sort of I'm trying to uh, argue how, on the one hand, you have uh, the, the, the problems uh, which are being addressed in certain limited pockets of Indian uh, population and Indian politics, which means that landowners, who are maybe you know, 10% or 15% of the, the total population which is affected by land acquisition, they are gaining in the process, right? And they are the most visible actors. Media and many kind of academic analysis are focused on that because that's the idea that you know the prevailing uh, frameworks can actually easily latch onto. So there is a state, there is society, the struggle between state and society. I'm trying to argue that it is far more complicated, and there are not only inter-regional variations and inter-state variations, but there are intra-state, intra-district, uh, intra-village, intra-community differences. Uh, one of the um, studies in Jaipur actually talks about two brothers who were affected in diametrically opposite ways by the same project which was acquiring land in their village. Right? So looking at this kind of disaggregated dynamics, it's not about sort of adding more details. It's about trying to s see the whole dynamics in a new light so that whatever we are seeing is a partial reality and that's a very distorting partial reality as far as um, uh, the, the, the whole picture is concerned. And that's why we actually see more land acquisition, as my predecessor actually talked about. See more land acquisitions than are required. We see many more land acquisitions that have happened without any protest, right? But the this, this scholarship somehow tend to focus on the protest and the outcomes of the protest. One of the things, you know, and this, this brings back to the sort of idea of, of um, you know, sort of uh, c cultural notions of property. Um, the, the picture here is the, the jareeb. It is the chain which is used for land surveys. Um, and this was invented, I think, by the Mughal um, uh, land administrators who were you know, trying to figure out how to measure land. So these are the pictures of the jareeb. And 
there have been many instances when, in which NGOs trying to help out the community for the sake of protecting their land rights have been objected against by the community members who object to the NGO's right to hold this jari because it's supposed to be the most authoritative symbol of state's authority to allocate land rights at the local level. And people will believe in the process only when that jareeb is held by a state uh, agent who's called an amin. I think I'll stop here. Thank you.